Welcome everyone to the first event of our series on the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, which is a project of Pax Christi International. We are coming to you from Cossester Catholic Worker House in Amaro, Wisconsin, located on the ancestral grounds of the Winnebago peoples. It is fitting that we begin this series sandwiched between the celebration of two historic practitioners of nonviolence. Yesterday was the International Day of Nonviolence on the birth date of Mahatma Gandhi. And tomorrow, October 4th, is the feast day of St. Francis of Assisi. Dorothy Day, the co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, was unwavering in her commitment to nonviolence, and so are we. We are sponsoring this particular series because we at Casa Esther believe the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative is the most significant development in the Catholic peace movement of this century. We want the knowledge of their work, research, and writings to be known far and wide. Can you put that slide up? We have a slide uh, of the cover of, of their publication that we'll try to put up. The edited, their edited writings of the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative are assembled in a book titled Advancing Nonviolence and Just Peace in the Church and the World. They produce this document as a resource for Catholic social teaching on nonviolence. All of the themes covered over the next five weeks are taken from this publication. And furthermore, we have all four of the editors of this publication as speakers in this series. You will begin to realize as you journey with us over these five weeks, what is being proposed is a revolutionary way of building peace and creating a just world order between peoples and nations. You will also learn that there are roles for all of us to play in this exciting venture. Now for a few announcements before we begin. First, when the presentations are finished, we will move into our question and answer session with the speakers. We invite you to post your questions in the chat at any time, and we will select as many questions as possible and give you the opportunity to ask the speakers yourself if you so desire. We invite reflective and challenging questions. Secondly, all of our speakers are associated with wonderful organizations and projects. In the next day or two, we will email everyone a list of resources that they are re recommending for further education and involvement in their organizations and projects and trainings. Lastly, our speakers also submitted reflection questions for you to meditate on over the next week. You will find those questions at www.cniseries.info. So those questions are posted at cniseries.info and they're reflection questions based on the presentations of our speakers tonight. All right, our moderator tonight is a good friend of mine, Michelle Sherman. Michelle is the 50th anniversary coordinator for Pax Christi USA. Her background is in spirituality and justice ministry with high school and college students and with young adults serving in post-grad service programs. While campus minister for retreats at Villanova University, she and Dr. Catherine Gedick Sotis launched nonviolent initiatives within campus ministry and the Center for Peace and Justice Education. She is also a spiritual director and retreat presenter. Welcome, Michelle, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, David. Welcome, everyone. Good evening or good morning um, or uh, Good afternoon if you're watching this tomorrow um, or the next day. I know we have a number of colleges and universities represented here tonight. And also we have, um, I know a number of colleges and universities will be using this recording later on. So we say welcome. Um, we have a wonderful group of speakers this evening. And so I'm going to introduce each speaker before they present. Um, and so welcome to this first uh, event in our series. So I'm going to welcome Ken Budigan to speak first. Ken Budigan is a senior lecturer in the Peace, Justice and Conflict Studies program at DePaul University in Chicago. 
He is also an affiliate faculty in the university's Catholic Studies Department. Ken has worked in a series of movements for social change, including campaigns addressing homelessness, nuclear weapons, freedom for East Timor, and the US wars in Iraq. In the 1980s, he was a co-founder and national coordinator of the Pledge of Resistance, which, nearly, which for nearly a decade mobilized nonviolence action for peace in Central America. Since 1990, Ken has worked with Pache Bene Nonviolent Service, which trains tens of thousands of people in the power of nonviolent change and which organizes campaign nonviolence, a long-term nationwide effort seeking to foster a more nonviolent culture free from war, poverty, racism, and iron environmental destruction. Thousands of events were organized across the US and around the world during its recent annual Campaign Nonviolence Weeks of Actions, September 21st through October 2nd, 2022. Ken serves on the Executive Committee of Pax Christi International's Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, which has co-sponsored with the Vatican two landmark conferences on nonviolence, exploring the possibility of the Catholic Church advancing nonviolence in the church and the world. He has published several books, including Pilgrimage Through a Burning World, Spiritual Practice and Nonviolent Protest at the Nevada Test Site, Nonviolent Lives, and one of my personal favorites, From Violence to Wholeness. Ken earned his PhD in the historical and cultural research of religions at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, where he researched nonviolence in a range of religious traditions. Welcome, Ken. Well, it's so wonderful to be with everyone uh, tonight. So the greatest social movement in human history is coming. Why? Because, because it has to. A great global movement of movements will be needed to end white supremacy, build equity for all, resist war and war systems, heal the earth, and challenge all forms of direct structural and cultural violence. What's needed is not only a large movement, but a deep one, a movement that mobilizes people power for the global structural changes that will be needed for this critical shift, including directly confronting and challenging the many structures and policies that dominate, diminish, and destroy human beings everywhere and our fragile planet. But we also need a global movement that sparks a spiritual awakening, a new way of treating all persons in a more compassionate and loving way. In short, a shift that takes on the problems in our lives and our world in a qualitatively new way. Over the past century, we have seen the growing emergence of a power and principle that can move us in this direction, active, creative, liberating, and muscular nonviolence. In my own experience, at four decades as an activist, I learned that all of us have more power than we think to unleash nonviolent change, to challenge wars, to support the unhoused, to protest torture, and to work for racial justice. I've been deeply moved by the risky but effective nonviolent struggles led by people of faith in the church against dictatorships. Nonviolent strategies do not claim to work every time, but we now know through qualitative research that they are twice as effective as violent ones. But I've also heard from people who wished that the church had preached and educated and spread the good news about nonviolence so that they could put Jesus's way beyond violence and passivity into practice in their lives, in their communities, in their societies. In hearing these stories and these yearnings, the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative has been moved to action. Nonviolence is not passive and ineffective, though that's what we've been told 
often. In fact, it is a form of power, not the power of violence, which is power over, but power with, the power of collaborative creativity, solidarity, risky, mercy, and alternatives to passivity and violence. This power is the birthright of all humanity. And it's been that way from the beginning. Gandhi said it's as old as the hills. Those of us who stand in the Christian tradition have begun to rediscover the nonviolence that Jesus called us to and lived. This evening, we begin this exciting series on gospel nonviolence and how a global effort called the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative is joining with people around the world in supporting the church in returning to the nonviolence of Jesus in our lives, our parishes, our diocese, and our world. Nonviolence is a spirituality, a way of life, a strategy for social change, and a universal ethic. Since 2016, CNI has invited the church and the world to embrace, promote, and integrate this robust way forward for a more just and peaceful world. We invite everyone watching and thinking about things to join this effort. CNI's work has been grounded in two integral foundations. First, the growing rediscovery of Jesus's nonviolence at the heart of the gospel and thus should be at the heart of the church. And second, the crucial need to respond to the global crisis of violence and injustice with powerful nonviolent solutions. So first, let's turn to the rediscovery of Jesus's nonviolence. Increasingly over the past century, nonviolence has been affirmed as central to the gospel in numerous papal and bishop statements, in an expanding body of theological research and scripture scholarship, in nonviolence education, formation, and pastoral practices, and in the lived experience of Catholics and others around the world, living the nonviolent life as a journey of faith and as a courageous witness for justice, peace, and reconciliation. Jesus proclaimed a nonviolent reign of God rooted in the unconditional love of God in the midst of an age of violence and oppression under the Roman Empire. He called on his disciples to love their enemies, to offer no violent resistance to one who does evil, to become peacemakers, to forgive and repent, and to be abundantly merciful. Jesus embodied nonviolence by actively resisting systemic dehumanization, as when he defied the law to heal the man with the withered hand, when he confronted the powerful at the temple and purified it, when he peacefully and with loving determination challenged the men accusing a woman of adultery, when he refused to call down fire on the Samaritans who had rejected his message, and when on the night before he died, he commanded Peter to put down the sword. Nonviolence is at the heart of the way of the cross and the resurrection. As Genesis says, all human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. So Jesus looks for ways that honors that sacredness and dignity. That means challenging, transforming, and resisting violence and oppression. But how can we do that? How do we confront violence and oppression? Well, we can run from it, we can accommodate it, go along with it, or we can go on the attack. These are age-old survival strategies but typically they do not solve the problem at hand. In fact, they can worsen violence and injustice in the world and in our own souls. Jesus had another answer, creative self-sacrificing love. When Jesus told us to love our enemies, to put down the sword, become peacemakers, he was marking out a radically different way forward for humanity. Love of enemies is a powerful force as peacemaker Angie O'Gorman declared, quote, by which Jesus meant wanting wholeness and well-being and life for all those who may be broken and sick and deadly. It was meant to be the cornerstone of an entirely new process of disarming evil, one which would decrease evil instead of feeding it, as violence does. In short, he invited us to discover that there's another way than violence, to resolve conflict, and to foster justice. 
Nonviolence has two hands that are in powerful creative tension, non-cooperation with injustice and steadfast regard for the opponent as a human being, even those people we don't like very much. It's a spiritual principle and a concrete strategy which regards violence as the enemy, not the people who are caught up in the cycle of retaliation and escalation. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. put it, nonviolence defeats injustice, not people. Now in the early church, there was no separate word for nonviolence. There didn't need to be. The word Christian signified what today we call nonviolence. Being Christian meant rejecting violence and loving one another, including those people we don't like very much. Being Christian meant taking up the nonviolent life as part of a nonviolent community. Being a follower of Jesus meant all the things that today we recognize as facets of nonviolence, including praying for those who persecute you, performing the works of mercy, returning good for evil, refusing to support war, forgiving and reconciling with one another, especially when we have strayed from the nonviolent path. For the first 300 years, being a Christian meant saying no and saying yes, no to violence in all of its dimensions, and yes to the infinite worth and sacred dignity of every person, not almost every person, but every person. During its first three centuries, the church practiced the nonviolence that Jesus taught and lived. Later, after its alliance with empire began in the fourth century, the spirit of gospel nonviolence was maintained by particular individuals, communities, and movements within the church. The larger church, though, often lost sight of this. In our own time, we have seen a growing effort to rediscover the nonviolence of Jesus and to put it at the center of the church's life. Pope Francis has been underscoring how critical this is. So the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative has been inspired by the growing rediscovery of the centrality of nonviolence in the gospel. But it has also been moved by the by to action, moved to action by the global crisis of violence and injustice, crying out for powerful nonviolent solutions. Imagine what it would mean if the Catholic Church with 1.3 billion people were to see itself as a nonviolent peace church. Howard Thurman, the great uh, theologian and mystic in his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, says that religion means nothing if it doesn't speak to the person whose back is against the wall. Perhaps even in our own time, Thurman would say, a planet whose back is against the wall. In March, 2021, last year, Pope Francis had three French activists over to the Vatican, and he gave him this, these gave them this uh, directive. Start a revolution. Shake things up. The world is deaf. You have to open its ears. Start a revolution. Shake things up. The world is deaf. You have to open its ears. And what kind of a revolution? Well, he says el elsewhere, a revolution of tenderness, carrying out the difficult and courageous work of struggling for a world where the well-being of all, especially the most rejected, the most excluded, and the most under attack is under priority and doing it with tenderness. Active nonviolence, campaign nonviolence, active nonviolence is key to the survival of Earth and to the healing of our planet. Nonviolence is a faithful and effective response to the direct violence of war and militarization, the cultural violence of indifference and domination, and the structural violence of racism, economic injustice, ecological destruction, and more. Nonviolence actively rejects the culture of violence and shows us the way to a no, new paradigm prom promoting the fullness of life. Propelled by this call to faithfully re-embrace gospel nonviolence in the midst of the global crisis of violence and injustice, the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative has taken many concrete steps over the past five years through its work with the Holy See, bishops and Episcopal conferences, universities, regional conferences, online webinars, religious communities and Catholic organizations. 
Pope Francis has been calling the world to nonviolence. He has taught us that the answer to this violence is not more violence. He has sought to move humanity from its tragic belief that violence is a solution. Rather than resolving the great challenges we face, violence often perpetuates and escalates them. As he said in his 2017 World Day of Peace message entitled Nonviolence, the Style of Politics for Peace, violence is not the cure for our broken world. May charity and nonviolence govern how we treat each other as individuals within society and in international life, especially in situations of conflict. Let us respect this, our deepest dignity, and make active nonviolence our way of life. To be true followers of Jesus today also includes embracing his teaching about nonviolence, Pope Francis says. The Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, a project of Pax Christi International, was founded to advance the possibility of the church fully embracing this core gospel value and to integrate it at every level of the church. We've held two conferences in Rome, co-sponsored with the Vatican, published a couple of books on the theology and practice of nonviolence, nurtured a global conversation with the church on this. In this series, you will hear about CNI's work that has been done in every corner of the world, as well as at the Vatican. You will also learn about the vision that propels it, that the church can be transformed and can in turn be a transforming presence for the nonviolent shift so critically needed in our wounded and sacred world. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Ken, I'm just going to echo back some of the key words and phrases um, that, that caught me, that captured my imagination as you were talking. Um, nonviolence is a spirituality, a way of life, a universal ethic, a set of strategies and principles. It is active, communal, social, and muscular. Quoting Pope Francis, the world is deaf. You have to open its ears. What we need is a revolution of tenderness. Active nonviolence is key to healing our planet. Our next speaker, I'm so excited to uh, introduce her to you, um, really takes uh, so many of the thoughts that um, Ken has introduced to us and puts that into practice in her, own, um, in her own integration and showing the intersectionality of nonviolence with social justice issues. So I'm so excited to introduce you to her. Elian Lakeham is an experienced facilitator and community organizer with a background in peace and security, housing and climate justice and education in emergencies. Her work focuses on advancing nonviolence and promoting women's participation as critical actors in all efforts to achieve sustainable peace and justice. Elian's training sessions empower participants to embrace nonviolence as a way of life and are rooted in the characteristics of cura personalis and the promotion of human dignity. Through interactive, context-relevant and trauma-informed approaches, she has trained people from all backgrounds and walks of life in the US and globally, including community and religious leaders, activists, elected officials, college students, and educators. She is the board coordinator of the DC Peace Team. She comes to us today from Italy where she is um, traveling right now. So it is very early in the morning um, for her. And just to share one, one piece of her work to show the integration. Her, these mugs that she has um, say climate justice is racial justice is nonviolence. Elian, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, 
I'm so grateful to be here and for sharing this platform with you. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the gift of your presence, but also acknowledging uh, the people who came before us. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and a few. Are you all able to see my screen? Yes. Great. So the question before us today is why nonviolence? And I'll begin by giving you a hint. Nonviolence is consistent with the gospel and it works. My presentation built on Ken's presentation and it provides additional element in support of the centrality of the practice of active nonviolence. It revolves around three aspects. First, we will briefly explore the nature of active nonviolence. Then we will discuss the practicality and the record of active nonviolence. And we will conclude with the interceptional dimensions of nonviolence. Let's just begin by saying that practicing active nonviolence is Christological. It is consistent with Jesus' teaching, and to be true follower of Jesus also means embracing his teaching about nonviolence. You see, like us, Jesus also lived in times of violence and disruption, but he addressed the most pressing issue of his time through nonviolence means. Let's now take a look at a few examples of when violence was most certainly on the table as an easy option, obviously, but Jesus chose to preach nonviolence. Jesus' instruction on nonviolence are clear and spell out in the longest recorded teaching of Jesus in the Bible, Matthew chapter five to seven, well known as the Sermon of the Mount. You're certainly familiar with this message and with this passage, I invite you to reread it with a perspective on nonviolent interventions. In Luke chapter 6, verse 27 to 36, Jesus asks us to love our enemy. In John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11, when a woman was about to be killed for committing adultery, Jesus did not attack her attackers, but he defended her with word calling us to reflect on our own scene and to refrain from judging and using violence against one another. On another occasion, when his disciple John to defend him from the crowd that had come to arrest Jesus, he asked the disciple to put his sword back in his place, making it clear that violence cannot be solved with violence. Now it's important to note that the text highlighted in red, Matthew 5, verse 39, where Jesus commanded us to turn the other cheek to those who slap us, has often been misunderstood. This brings us to a very important point. Nonviolence is not pacifism, but it is an active response to violence that just involve different and more powerful and creative weapons, such as diplomacy, love, compassion, mercy, reconciliation, forgiveness, the list go on and on. The goal here is not to let go passively, but to challenge unjust structure and system without using the same harmful tactics. So it comes back to affirming the humanity and dignity of the other, even when that other person perpetrates this unjust system. Pope Francis said it best in his 2017 World Day of Peace message, and I invite you to read that message. Um, so he wrote, nonviolence is sometimes taken to meet surrender, lack of involvement, and passivity, but it is not the case. Nonviolence, again, is not simply a method, 
but a way of life that take his lead from practicing it daily and embracing it fully, completely in the way we interact with other and what we consume. And so we discussed in the practicality and record of active nonviolence, we can see that there is strong empirical evidence for the power of nonviolence. Nonviolent actions like protests, sittings, boycott, they have been very key and very central in enacting change in our history. And research showed that nonviolent action are likely to lead to sustainable outcome than violent actions. On the screen, you have some data from the Nonviolent and Violent Campaign in Outcome. That is a project led by Harvard University. The project collects systematic data on violent insurgency and nonviolent civil resistance campaign around the world. The data here were gathered on 622 campaign between 1900 in 2019. Nonviolent campaign are protests where the majority of participants are unarmed. Campaign that succeeded are those that achieve 100% of their stellar goal within a year of the peak activities. As you can see on the chart, 47%, that's almost half of the nonviolent campaign succeeded, while only a quarter of the violent campaign did. 56% of violent campaign fell as compared to 30% on nonviolent one. It is important to note that nonviolent campaign don't always succeed, but they are twice as likely to succeed than violent campaigns and their results are most likely to be sustainable. Why, you may ask, well, it is easier to mobilize people from all backgrounds to participate in nonviolent campaign as compared to recruiting for an army. This is because nonviolence resistance presents fewer barriers to moral and physical involvement. Here we have more data highlighting the success rates of nonviolent and violent mass campaign by decade. And this is from 1930 to 2019. And as you can see again and again, nonviolence work. Other historical example of the power of active nonviolence include the work of nonviolent peacemaker that you may know like Mother Teresa, who fought for the poor, Ganti, who championed the liberation of India for colonization, Dr. Martin Luther King, Dorothy Day, Pope John Paul II, and more recently, Lima Gabale, who engaged in nonviolent action that contributed to the end of the Second Civil War in Liberia. If you haven't done so already, I invite you to explore their work more fully. I'll also invite you to write down the name and other champion, the name of other champion of nonviolence that you may know and to reflect on their approach to addressing violence. In her own word, Dorothy Day argued that peace begin when the hungry are fed. Peace begin when the hungry are fed. But what does that truly mean? And what it is, what is the relation between balance and hunger? This takes us to our next part, the intersectional dimension of nonviolence. Active nonviolence is intersectional and mean more, much more than ending war and physical violence. It entails a commitment to positive peace, which requires to address all forms of violence, direct, structural, cultural, and ecological. For example, gospel nonviolence also entails implementing nonviolent solution in response to the cry of the earth, a cry that calls for the protection of our common home from the violence of climate change and growing culture of destructive extractivism 
and war. As Wishers has shown, preparation for war and other military activity involve fossil fuel and significantly contribute to climate change, which impact community at the margin more disproportionately. Practicing active nonviolence also entail responding to the cry of the poor and those who are marginalized, oppressed, and discriminated against. Racism, for example, is a blatant form of violence and an attack of human dignity that goes against God's plan. A broader list of the actual nonviolence will be shared in Rosie's presentation, which I'm super excited about. But I would like to leave you with a urgent call from Pope Francis. The call captures this aspect and the need of addressing violence through an intersectional lens. We are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature. Now that you know more about the good news about nonviolence, what will you do? Thank you all for listening. And I invite you to make nonviolence and active nonviolence your way of life. Let's just take a minute to pause, to take a deep breath, perhaps let our minds settle on a word or a phrase that was shared. And I invite you to just type that word or phrase into the chat. And as questions come up throughout these presentations, I see we also have um, a few questions that have been coming in. Um, please be free to write down those words or phrases for the communal uh, shared wisdom of this space and also your questions and we'll get you uh, question and answers later. Peace begins when the hungry are fed, that quote from Dorothy Day, beautiful tenderness. As you were speaking, uh, it struck me that this idea of creative nonviolence requires creativity and how um, nonviolence is for everyone, everyone's gifts and talents. And so I'm so excited to introduce you to our next speaker, Rosie Davila, who brings an artistic spirit to this work of nonviolence. And that is so clear to see um, if you've attended any um, of the uh, events from Pace Bene, uh, seen social media posts. So we're so happy to have you with us, Rosie. Rosie Davila is the art and media coordinator for Pace Bene nonviolence, campaign nonviolence, and a senior at the University of Kentucky. She is an artist and a poet and lives on a flower farm in Kentucky with her twin sister and parents. Rosie, welcome. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to everybody who is here tonight. I'm so happy to see y'all. Thank you, Eliane and Ken in particular. Your sharings were very moving for me and I'm very grateful. Um, hi everybody, I'm Rosie and um, Ken is one of my friends and colleagues and Eliane I have met recently and I'm just thrilled to be here. Um, so one thing that I like to start off with is, how did I get interested in nonviolence? Um, I first got interested in nonviolence 
10 years ago. So that was when I was 11 years old. I was a little kid. And my mom told me the story of my great great grandfather Alberto. So I'm a Latina and my family came to America in several uh, sort of spurts, but once during the Mexican Revolution, um, because my great grandfather Alberto was killed because he refused to participate in war. So they killed him as an example when he wouldn't join their militia. Um, he was a strong Catholic and he believed that it would be a sin for him to fight. And if I'm being perfectly honest with you, this story shook me to my core. I come from a military family. My dad was in the military. Three out of four of my grandparents were in the military. I had never heard a story of this type of active resistance before. I didn't get it. I kept thinking, what? He just like died. He didn't like go off and hope that he came back, that he'd come back okay. So I knew I had to find out why Alberto took such strong and bold action. So I spent the next lots of years reading about nonviolence because I was like, that must have been his jam. He must have loved that. And I read about Daniel and Philip Berrigan. Some of y'all might have heard of them. Cesar Chavez, Dorothy Day. Do I have any fans of any of them in here? Can you raise your hand? <laughs> Good, good, some people. And so what I want you to do now is if there's anybody who has inspired you in nonviolence, this could be anybody from a famous activist like Greta Thunberg to your grandma, anybody. I want you to put their name in the chat. I wanna see who's inspired you. As I started to read about these people, oh, thank you. I'm gonna enjoy reading these, thank you. As I started to read, oh, Ken, you're in there, <laughs> great. <laughs> As I started to read about these people, I realized that nonviolence isn't just about being passive. Like Eliane said, nonviolence is transformative and it really works. One beautiful aspect of nonviolent movements is that it can include people from all generations. One of my roles at Pache Bene is co-sponsoring the Youth Collective with my colleague, Shana Jones. We meet online a couple of times a month. I think some of our members are here tonight, yay, <laughs> um, to plan actions. And so if you would like to join us, if you know someone who would like to join us, um, there's gonna be a link at the end of this. So please connect with us. Um, we would love to have you. And at Pache Bene, I also love working with Rivera Sun. Um, and we wanted to expand on this idea of nonviolence. So I illustrated, I'm an artist, and I illustrated a poster series that shows that nonviolence isn't just ending wars. It's not just protest. It has lots of different expressions and many things that it affects. Nonviolence is also keeping our planet healthy, ending racism and homophobia, making sure that everyone has a home and more. So right now to close, I wanna show you some of these posters. I'm gonna play some music to kind of help us fall into this moment. And as we reflect on these, let's be attentive to what causes really touch us. Uh, as you see these, you might see a cause that you work for that's represented in this series. There are lots of people in these posters. You might see yourself. You might see a friend of yours. You might see yourself in those issues. You may want to pray about the, your role as an activist. So as you see these posters in, in just a second, um, when you see one that really touches you, I want you to write Lord, hear our prayer in the chat box. So when you see one that might be a cause that you work for, right? Lord, hear our prayer. I will start off with the first poster. And so we'll take these last few minutes to reflect on our own commitment to nonviolence and its many forms. And I'd just like to say thank you all for being here tonight. I'm loving reading your heroes in the chat box. So many of these are my heroes as well. Um, so thank you. I am going to attempt to share my screen now and the audio. Okay, can y'all see my home screen there? <laughs> 
Okay. Oh, and there is my great grandfather, Alberto. So there he is. Um, let me see how I can make this bigger. Uh, sorry, guys. I am not, I'm going to use Google instead because I am not well versed in Windows. Here we go. No, 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 no. Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with this. I am going to thank you all for your patience. I'm actually going to play this on my phone, the music. Thank you, everyone. And if you want to get those posters, you can look on Pache Ivani's website. They're there to download for free. Thank you all for your time. That was beautiful, Rosie. I, I feel I felt myself just um, putting my hand on my heart as you were 
showing all of your images with the music and seeing the echoes of Lord hear our prayer. Um, it, it, it makes me think about what was being held in this space about that revolution piece, a revolution of tenderness, and how Dorothy Day said a revolution must begin with the revolution of the heart. And art and creativity uh, really speaks to that deep rooted heart centeredness, which gives us strength for the that activism and peace with justice. So thank you for contributing your gifts to this very important work of peace with justice and active nonviolence. 